Hey, good morning, church family. It's good to see you. Good to be with you. If you're uh, online, it's good to be with you as well. This morning, let's take this time. Let's stand up and shake the hands and hug the necks of those around us. All right, as we make our uh, way back to our seats, I would just like to say welcome um, to church this morning. I hope that uh, you're doing well, that you've had a good week. Uh, cooler weather is on the way, they're saying. And um, this morning, also, in your chair in front of you, there should be a little card. So if you're a guest this morning, I would like to say we are super glad that you have decided to worship with us. So if you would just fill out that card and just kind of drop it in one of our boxes, we, will, we would love to connect with you. If there's anything we can do as a staff to pray for you, uh, just to help you in any way, please just let us know. Uh, we're going to read a couple of verses this morning, and then we will uh, just dive into worship. Uh, Psalms 117 says this, Praise the Lord, all nations. Glorify him, all peoples. For his faithful love to us is great. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Hallelujah. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we love you. Thank you just that we can just come here together just to worship you, Father. I pray that we would just come with expectations for you to move, for you to speak as you always do, Father. As we just uh, sing song and dive into your word, God, I pray that we would just hear from you in a new way, that we would just cry out and just in thankfulness. Father, just thank you for this church. God, I ask that you would just bless us and use us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Strong. 
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. No God of grace cleanses me of sin. You're strong embrace Keep me still No oh God of grace Cleanses me of sin You're strong Andy's going to lead us uh, in this next song, In Christ Alone. Um, we, uh, I love this song, uh, but I really like it whenever somebody else sings it. <laughs> and I like it whenever uh, one of our ladies sings it, and so I, I talked her into this one. Um, it's just a really wordy song, and you all know I like the wordy songs, but this one's kind of hard to sing. Um, when I sing it, it's like way down there, you know, and uh, kind of loses some of its luster. But uh, she's going to sing it for us. Um, what heights of love, what depths of peace. Uh, when fears are stilled and when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Uh, here in the love of Christ I stand. It's just good stuff. So let's sing it.
kingdom of God by his own betray the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus lake silent as he stood accused beaten Bowing to the Father's will, he took the crown of thorns. Know oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul.
praise and honor unto you. Thank you, God, for giving us Jesus, who made a way for us to get to you, who made a way unto salvation for those of us who were born hopeless, entangled uh, in sin and in sin and in slavery to it. God, we uh, we're thankful for you. We're thankful for uh, how you take care of us, how you provided for us. And it is in Christ alone that we believe these things. And it's in his name. Can be dismissed uh, up through fifth grade. Uh, if you are new and have a child up through fifth grade, they can either stay in here with us or they can be dismissed for children's church. Either way, that is not a problem. So they may, they can be dismissed at this time. And while they are doing that, I want to invite everybody else to open up to, uh, if you'd get your copy of the the Word of God, where the whether a, a hard copy or electronically, if you'd open up, turn it on, power it up to Joshua, Joshua. Uh, go to 13 is where you probably looked at your bulletin you saw man 13 through 21 that's a lot yeah it is a lot this morning but we'll we'll be able to summarize that um, today um, as well but I want to start off by reading this story and you've probably seen this video it has made the it has made the round I mean it's, it's an older video but it's made the rounds on all sort uh, forms of social media and platforms but it's about the father who helped his son cross the finish line at the 1992 Olympics. And, and I'm gonna, so I get the story correctly. I'm going to read some of this from one of the magazines I found. The story begins in the 1992 Summer Olympic Games in Barcelona. Derek Redman was a sprinter for Great Britain. Seeking to overcome the injuries that had plagued him, because uh, he had had five surgeries, including one on his Achilles tendon, with less than four months before the Games. His Olympic dreams had been dashed four years earlier at the 88 Games in Seoul where he tore his Achilles an hour before the race. So Redmond's pursuit of a medal in Barcelona in the 400 meters started off well as he notched the fastest time in the prelims and won his quarterfinal heat. In the semifinals, he charged out of the blocks, looked strong on the first straightaway, but shortly before the race's halfway mark, he suddenly grimaced in pain, and he grabbed the back of his right thigh. His hamstring was torn. He crumpled to, his, to the track in pain and dismay as the rest of the pack sprinted on past the finish line. Redmond stood, began hopping on his left foot, careful to remain in his lane, determined to finish the race. The crowd stood and cheered as Redmond limped slowly toward the finish line. But then a figure emerged from alongside the track. It was his dad, Jim. Waving off officials who tried to get Jim off the track, Jim ran up to his son. Putting an arm around his waist, Derek turned and wept on his father's shoulder. And together, father and son walked the final meters of a race now long decided. We're going to finish Joshua probably next week, but today we're talking about finishing well. These latter parts, the early 13 through 21, we're going to look about finishing well, okay? Just as Jim experienced, I mean, obstacle after obstacle, surgery after surgery, he could have given up. I mean, if Joe knows what an Achilles uh, tear is, and some of you others may know what an Achilles tear is. It is painful, and it is a long rehab process, but he didn't quit. He could have quit. He could have given up. He could have thrown in the towel. He could have stopped. He could have said, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to be an Olympic champion. I'm not going to make the Olympics again. I'm going to do something else, but he did it. He didn't quit. He didn't give up. And here he is in the race, and he's doing well. And all of a sudden, the, another, a, a separate injury occurs. And you've, like I said, you've probably seen the video of him hopping along. And if not, man, Google it, Jim Redman Olympics. And it's, a, it's just, a, it's just a, a wonderful pick-me-up story. But here's the deal, folks. All of us, as believers, as believers, we have things that come at us. Some of you right now, you got something coming at you. Okay? And it can easy, easily cause you 
to quit, to give up, to stop, whether it be spending time in the Word, spending time coming to church, or I'm not sure about this Christianity thing. I mean, we can all find something. I mean, every single one of us could find something to say, I'm done, I'm over, I'm throwing in the towel. But I lo- what I love about this story, his dad, his dad breaks through the officials in the line and goes and helps his son. Folks, believers, we have a heavenly father, amen, that is there for us. That has reminded Joshua over and over and over. Because, man, Joshua has faced a lot of obstacles. A ton of obstacles, if you're familiar with the story. A ton of obstacles. A ton of humanly impossible situations. And the Lord never gave up. Never quit. One of the things you learned about the story of Joshua, the Lord is faithful. He was faithful then. He's faithful now. He's faithful forever. Amen? Man, we must finish the race that God has set out for us. What we'll see in the story, really from 13 to 21, we'll summarize it today, is how to finish well. How to finish the race that God has for every single one of us and to finish it well. The first thing is this, listen, we're not running this race alone. Amen? Man, I'm so grateful and thankful. I'm so grateful and thankful. I'm not running this Christian race by myself because I couldn't do it. Because I got a list of things. Matter of fact, I got a list of people that, could, that I could have easily let get the best of me. Or say, man, I'm done. I quit. This isn't worth it. I didn't, I'm not called to be a pastor so I can put up with this. Man, I'm so thankful I got this great church that the Lord has blessed me with. Amen? I'm so grateful for the word of God, just like you. I'm so grateful, we're so grateful for brothers and sisters in Christ around the world that we may have that check up on us, say, hey, how you doing? Keep us in line. I'm so grateful and thankful for my wonderful family, as well as you are. Joshua has had these as well. Here's what's going on in this, from 13 to 21. Basically, from 13 to 21, because like we looked at last week, we looked at 11 and 12 last week. Basically, the wars, the battles that that the Lord led Joshua to be a part of have ceased. And and the Lord said there's now calm or absence of wars. It's it's over in 1123. Joshua took the entire land just as the Lord had directed Moses. He gave it as an inheritance to Israel. Now, remember that word inheritance. According to their tribal divisions, then the land had rest from war. And so basically, 13 through 21, 13 through 21 is going to be this this land called the promised land, land of Canaan, what is now modern day Israel, but it's bigger bigger dimensions then. They're going to be divided. So there are 12 different tribes, okay, and the 12 different tribes are going to get a land allotment. Um, I can't see who's running the back. So. Will you put up the picture I put on the computer? Sorry, with these lights, and it has nothing to do with me being old, okay? Okay, here's a real quick, real quick, okay? Real quick picture, okay, of the Israel. All the different colors represent a different tribe, okay? I don't expect you to read them, okay? So I'm not asking you to read them, but just so you have a visual. But you notice there's two bodies of water. There's a little bitty one, okay, up north, up, up high on the screen, Okay, and then there's another one straight south or straight below it. Basically, the Jordan River is what started way above all those colors. It started up in the mountains. Okay, so that's how the river, the Jordan River started. It comes in the Sea of Galilee. So the small little body of water on the top part of the picture is the Sea of Galilee. Okay, and then the Jordan River comes out of the Sea of Galilee down into the Dead Sea. And that's where it finishes. And so the bigger body of water is the Dead Sea. Closer to the Dead Sea, that's where when Joshua crossed the Jordan River, that's where he came in, okay? Google that, but those different colors represent the different tribes, because remember, this goes all the way back to the Old Testament, okay? All the way back to the Old Testament. You can take that down now, okay? Because in Genesis 12, God speaks to a 75-year-old man, okay, named Abram. Abram lived in Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq, and he said, hey, pack up your family, and head to this direction. I'm going to tell you where to go. Well, he goes, it, it's to go into the land of Canaan, okay? And then Genesis chapter 17, now Abram is 99 years of age. God gives him a new name called Abraham at 99 years of age. And he says, I'm going to make a nation out of you. Kings will come from you. And I'm going to give you this whole land 
of Canaan as an everlasting possession to him and your descendants after you. Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Jacob's name will then be named Israel. And then in Genesis chapter 47, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, or Israel, moves from the land of Canaan, okay, the promised land. He moves from there because of a drought, which leads to a famine, and he goes to Egypt because one of his sons, Joseph, is there in Egypt. So Jacob takes his whole family, his, all, of, all of his other sons, and they go to Egypt where Joseph is at, and that's where they land. And then after several years, then that's when the nation of Israel, okay, if you will, they become slaves for 430 years in Egypt. And then all of a sudden in Exodus chapter 3 is when Moses is entered the picture. At 80 years of age, that's going to come into play here in a minute. At 80 years of age, uh, the Lord raises up Moses. Remember, he had, he had been a shepherd for 40 years because when he was around 40, he killed somebody. But God wasn't finished with Moses. So at 80 years of age, God raises up Moses from leading sheep. He just thought he was taking care of sheep, but he's, he's fixing. Well, that's an Oklahoma term, fixing. He's getting ready to lead a bunch of Israelites that are just like the sheep. And so Mo, the Lord raises up Moses out, uh, to, to lead the Israelites out of Egypt to the promised land. And so the Lord le leads Moses and the Israelites, 2.5 plus million people, out of Egypt to, the, to Mount Sinai. And then on their way up, then jo Joshua takes the reins. So Joshua's around 80 years of age. When he takes the rein, he marches them into the land of Canaan, to the promised land, or modern-day Israel extended. And that's where we're at today. But there's several things. And so what happens in 13 through 21 is all these pieces of land being given to the different tribes. So 13 through 21, you look through that, there's a whole bunch of names. I know you were thinking, man, I'm so glad he's not reading them. We're not. Can't say half the names. Okay? But that's what 13 through 21 are. And so we see the fulfillment of God's purpose, God's plan. Because God's not finished with them. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to, to look at, at Joshua chapter 13, verse 1. Because if we're going to finish well, and we're going to, if we're going to finish well, the first thing is this, we must be willing to serve and be used by the Lord. Because Joshua is. Look at 13.1. Okay, we're going to look, there's not a main text, we're going to look at a lot of different scriptures this morning to, to, to finish this up. 13.1, when Joshua had grown old, the Lord said to him, you are now very old. Gosh, thanks a lot, Lord. What a way. I'm so glad. Thanks for picking me up. When Joshua had grown old, the Lord said to him, you are now very old. Not just old, very old. Basically, he's around 90-ish, okay? Joshua takes the reins around 80. He's now around 90. You are very old. Now, there are, but there are still very large areas of land to be taken over. And what's happening is from basically 13 on, there are going to be small pocket cities that each one of the tribes, as the tribes are sent out to their boundaries, there's going to be some tribal land taken. And we're going to look at that here in, in a minute for those, each one of the tribes. That's, but while Joshua was leading, everything was good. Now, now jump over to the end, 24. Look at Joshua chapter 24, verse 29. Because here's what I want us to see. Joshua finishes well. Joshua didn't let his age get in the way. Joshua didn't give, give up. Because in Joshua chapter 24, verse 29. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord. Notice, the servant of the Lord. See, God had a, a greater purpose for Joshua than whatever purpose Joshua had set out for. Church, listen, God has a great purpose for you. And I hope you see yourself as a servant of the Lord, no matter what you do, no matter where you're at. As followers of Christ, as disciples of Christ, as Christians, we are servants of the Lord. Amen? And God sends us all out, all, all over the place. There's a reason some of us are not school teachers. And some of us said amen. There's a reason some of you are mechanics and some of us are not. And my family knows if they got a car problem, yeah, we don't call dad. We, we don't call dad. We call anybody but dad because he doesn't know a thing. I'm, I, I admit that. I'm okay with that. Okay, they don't hurt my feelings, but you, you get, we all have a purpose. Look at this. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. 
In Joshua 13, he's told he's very old, but he doesn't die until he's 110. Hey, Joshua still got around 20, around, a little less, 20 years left. That when you read through Joshua 13 on, Joshua's still going to be involved. He didn't, he didn't quit. Joshua didn't say, hey, you know what, I've done my part. The Lord's used me to conquer some pretty, pretty incredible battles. I think, I've, you know, I've got, a, I've got a bookshelf in my little, my little uh, place, and I've got all these trophies. There's, jo- there's Jericho, and there's, no, Joshua didn't quit, church, because he, he, he realized and recognized and accepted the, the joy and the responsibility. I am a servant of the Lord first, church, believers in Christ, followers of Jesus. We must continually have the attitude and the mindset that I am a servant, that we are servants of the Lord, and the Lord sends you and I out all over this place to be servants of the Lord. Amen? That's why you are gifted and talented and equipped to do what you do, and others aren't. That's how God wired you. That's how God made you. That's how God purposed you. And Joshua didn't quit because he got older. Yeah, things Got different things slowed down, absolutely. Look in chapter 14, because there's another guy, another good friend of his, Caleb. And we haven't heard anything about Caleb, but Caleb comes back in the picture. Remember, 40, about 40-some 40 years prior to this, Joshua and Caleb were young bucks, and they were two of the 12 that God sent to go spy out the promised land before they were getting ready to enter it. He said, I'm going to send you guys across there. And the 12 come back and say, yeah, it's exactly like the Lord said, okay? It's bountiful, but man, there's some people there that are bigger and stronger than us. There's no way we can conquer it. And Joshua and Caleb were the only two that said no. And Joshua and Caleb were the only two out of those 12 and every other man that same age. Joshua and Caleb were the only two that, that lived. Because the Bible says that they would be punished for their disobedience. Because the other ten raised up, they basically raised up the rest of the Israelites to grumble, to complain, and say, we can't do this, and get mad at Moses and get mad at the Lord. And only Joshua and Caleb did not. And once that whole generation of men passed away, that's when the Lord began to move the Israelites to enter the promised land. But look at 14. Man, this isn't, I love, this is, Caleb's got to be on some serious Red Bull for that time, okay? Because he is now 85 years of age. Look at, look at 14.10. So Caleb's going to get his allotment of, of land, okay? 14.10, now then, just as the Lord promised. Love that word. Still the promise keeper. He has kept me alive. Okay, this, is an 80, uh, this, this dude is 85 years of age, Okay. Just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses. While Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Man, that guy is a servant to the Lord. Amen. And there is nothing getting in the way of this 85-year-old man's life. Caleb didn't throw in the towel. Moses didn't throw in the towel. Joshua didn't throw in the towel. We could go on and on and on. But I love what he says. The reason, look at that end of verse 12. But the Lord is helping me. It's not to say everything was easy for Caleb and Joshua. It's not to say he didn't have difficult days. It's not to say he didn't have times of frustration, discouragement, doubt. But he's a servant to the Lord. He said, the Lord is helping me. Listen, let's make it personal. We might retire from the employment world, but listen, that does not mean one retires from serving the Lord. We might be a teenager or even younger, but that does not keep one from serving and being used by the Lord. Amen, church? Okay, listen, church. We must say that louder because we got a bunch of teenagers and children listening. Teenagers and younger are allowed to serve in this church. Amen, church? Because guess what? 
If teenagers aren't serving right now, we got no audio video, we got no preschooler, and we got no children's church. Guess what? They're all in here with you and I. All of a sudden, you're like, hey, praise the Lord for teenagers. <laughs> it's one of the things I love about our church. Right now, there's teenagers serving all over this church. Right now, in the preschool area, we prob- we've got three generations of people serving. If they're the church of, if they are the church of the future, if they're not allowed to serve now, they won't be in church in the future. But here's the other thing. You, we might have some type of disability or limitation, but that does not prevent one from serving or being used by the Lord. Amen, church? Because God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. God uses people that are available and surrendered. Revelations chapter 2.10, be faithful even to the point of death. Because we walk by faith. Amen? I mean, I had a great example. And you've heard me, you, you've heard me reference my grandpa. My grandpa on my dad's side passed away at 94 just a few years ago. I mean, the guy was golfing at 91 once a week. At 92, he was still going to his church every week and folding bulletins, getting communion ready or whatever, making a phone call, whatever he needed to do until, until his mind and his body would prevent him or, or the uh, driver's license bureau said, Oscar, you can't drive anymore. So he found a way to serve the Lord. Somebody picked him up and took him to the church. Listen, I, I'm, I'm not getting... not. I'm not getting on to anybody, okay? So please, if you're new, you're like, man, is something going on? No, I'm not. We're going to finish well, amen? And there are going to be things that come at us and try to distract us, disrupt us, cause us to quit, throw in the towel, say, I'm done. I've done my time. I've done my service. I've done my, my ministry. I did that. I've got, the, I've got the worn out knees, the worn out hands from serving the Lord. Now, that's nowhere in Bible. We keep serving the Lord, Amen? And I just want to encourage you from the word of the Lord, man, if, if, if we are here today with a mindset, man, I've done that, man, I, I hope, I hope the word of the Lord, as we, we are just reminded, to finish well means we are willing to serve and be used by the Lord. Man, I hope if you've had that mindset, I hope you will get back into the serving the Lord, wherever he plants you, wherever he sends you, whatever he has you doing, I hope you will get back. I hope the word of the Lord, the work of the Holy Spirit will convict you today to get back into the game of serving the Lord and serving his church. Amen? I mean, you see every week, listen, I'll just be honest, church, you see every week, like right now, like last week, Kim had 50, 50 kids in children's church last week. Praise the Lord, amen? We got young families coming to our church, but we need more help. She needs help on Wednesday nights and, and Sunday mornings. In the preschool, Jennifer always needs help back there. Finishing well. Finishing well means we're willing to serve and be used by the Lord. That's what we see Joshua. Joshua didn't quit. He didn't give up. Look at 13, 22. The second thing is this. If we're going to finish well, chapter 13, verse 22. There's something here that the Israelites do to remove an obstacle, a known obstacle that has impacted them and caused them problems in the past. 13, 22. In addition to those slain in battle, the Israelites had put to the sword Balaam, son of Beor, who practiced divination. If we're going to finish well, we've got to be willing to be serving and being used by the Lord. And we must remove the known stumbling blocks. See, divination is like wizard, wizardry, casting spells and curses. And this name sounds familiar because you could go all the way back to Numbers chapters 22 and 24 when the Israelites at that time, okay, they were in the, that was their wilderness period. It was a, it's the story of Balak, the king of Moab, requesting Balaam, this very guy here that we just read about in 22, to put a curse on the Israelites because there were so many Israelites he was afraid of them. It's the story of Balaam and the, t- the talking donkey, okay? 22, 24. I mean, it, not only is it something that a donkey's talking, but the dude talks to the donkey. So I'm not sure which one's crazier. But in that story, okay, and what they do is notice what we just read in 13, 22. They remove a known stumbling block. Because here's what the Bible says about Balaam. 
Revelations 2.14, Balaam encouraged people to join him and to practice idolatry and fornication. Peter writes in 2 Peter 2.15, they have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam who loved wickedness. Balaam encouraged people to join him and to practice idolatry and fornication. Balaam was a stumbling block to the Israelites. To finish well, we must remove those, stum- those known stumbling blocks that are in our life that's what the Israelites did right there in that story they knew to finish well we got to get rid of this particular individual here's what it's saying to us to finish well we may have to remove ourselves remove ourselves from people habits situations beliefs that are not in line with scripture and that don't glorify or elevate Jesus that pull us down, that pull us away from Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company corrupts good character. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes, notice, on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, and for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Here's the application, church. What in our lives is causing us or could cause us to sin, to move away from the things of God or the potential that God has for or through you and I. Because here's the deal. Sin will take us further than we want to go. Sin will charge us a higher price than we want to pay. And it will keep us there longer than we want to stay. The Israelites, in order to finish well, they're going to have to remove. And they do. They remove this obstacle, this stumbling block. To finish well, we're going to keep serving the Lord. We're not going to quit. To finish well, we've got to remove the stumbling blocks. But not only that, to finish well... We must continually walk in obedience to the Lord. Go, go to um, Deuteronomy chapter 20. Okay, I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 20. Because there's something that happens here that the Israelites, I want to, they don't do. And it becomes a problem for, for them for the rest, really for, the, for generations to come. Because the Lord told the Israelites, when you go into these new lands, remember, they're the reason there, and we've talked about this previously, the reason there are that the Lord tells the Israelites to go in the land and to totally destroy Jericho and all these other places is because for over 400 years, these nations had rejected the Lord. They had rejected, they had rejected. They knew about this great God that the Israelites loved and served and followed because they had heard about the, all the miracles that he had done. But remember, in the story, there were very few. Rahab and her family were one of them. Very few that, that turned to and trusted in the God of the Israelites. All these other kings j- joined together, united together to fight the Israelites. And there was a consequence. There's a cost. But when the Lord said... Because the time is now for them to go into the promised land. He also said this, okay? You got Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 16, 18. Okay, stay there, but listen to, I'm going to read Numbers 33, 52. Because this has been said to them many times. Okay, Numbers 33, 52. The Israelites are to drive out all the inhabitants of the land before them. Destroy all the carved images, the cast idols, demolish all their high places, take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given you the land to possess. The Lord told the Israelites, get rid of the things that the, these other nations, remember, they've been in slavery. They've been told what to do, how to live. Everything's been provided for them. And so the reason he gives them the Levitical law, the reason he gives them other laws is so they know how to worship the Lord correctly, not based on what they see the other nations do. Because they worship everything made by hands and carved. He also gives them the Levitical law, the Israelites, so they know how to govern themselves. And he gives them the Levitical law and that how, so they know how to treat one another correctly, what he expects of them. And he says, when you go into this new land, I don't want you to practice anything you saw in Egypt. I don't want you to practice and worship anything you're seeing some of these other nations do. So you go in and you wipe out and take out all these things that they worship, these idols that they bow down to, okay, that can't help 
But he says there in, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 16, he also saw, however, in the cities of the nations the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them. And he goes through the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you. Notice, otherwise, if you do not, they will teach you to follow their detestable things. They do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord. Sounds easy, right? Well, listen, look at, go to Joshua 13, 13. As the land divisions have been given by boundaries, the Lord sends them out, the, the tribes, to get their, their land. And there, yes, there's going to be some, those tribes are going to have some battles because of cities within. But I want you to listen to these four verses. Hebrews 13, 13. And see if what we read doesn't line up with what we just read, which was the Lord saying, you must do this. Hebrews 13, 13. But the Israelites did not drive out the people of Geshur and Mecca. So they continue to live among the Israelites to this day. You see that? But the Israelites did not drive out. And here's what's interesting. You know, the, the people of Geshur. Geshur is going to come back up because David had a wife from this tribe Geshur they had a son called Absalom Absalom killed a brother you see had the Israelites wiped out this tribe that would have happened okay let's keep going Joshua fifteen sixty three. as another tribe goes out And gets their land allotment. Fifteen sixty three. Judah could not dislodge the Jebusites, who were living in Jerusalem. And to this day, the Jebusites live there with the people of Judah. Notice, Judah could not dislodge the Jebusites. The Lord, the Lord said, "They're what numbers." Over in Numbers and Deuteronomy, Numbers 33 and 20, as well as other places, you are to wipe out. Judah didn't, could not. Go to 16.10. 16.10. They did not dislodge the Canaanites living in Gezer. And to this day, the Canaanites live among the people of Ephraim, but are required to be forced labor. Go to 17.12. Seventeen twelve. Yet the Manassites were not able to occupy these towns, for the Canaanites were determined to live in that region. Look at thirteen. However, when the Israelites grew stronger, they subjected the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not drive them out completely. What did the Lord tell them to do? He said, "When you get to a land, when you get to a city, you're to drive them out." Because I don't want you following their practices. I don't want you intermarrying. I don't want you following their practices and worshiping their gods. They are going to lead you astray. Bad company corrupts good morals. Well, if you, if you just look at the history of Israel, because, at least in those four cases, because they didn't do what the Lord said fully, completely, these nations that they didn't, these people groups that they didn't drive out became a stumbling block for the nation of Israel. The Philistines, which we read a lot about, if, you were to continue, if we were to continue to do a chronological study of the Bible, then the, the, the Philistines would continually come up and come up and come up and come up. It's because they weren't fully driven out because the Israelites did not totally obey the Lord. These nations did not fully, totally wipe out the nation, these other nations, and they would become pains in the sides of the Israelites, and they would lead them to do things that God said I don't want you to do and this is why I want you to wipe them out we are to walk in total obedience to the Lord and that is not going to always be easy and that is not always going to be comfortable and that is not always going to be pleasant 
And you know what? There are going to be times walking in total obedience is going to come with a cost and a sacrifice. But listen, hear me. The cost and the sacrifice is always worth it. Amen? It's always worth it. And we must not give in to this temptation, this feeling. Well, partial obedience is better than no obedience. No, it's still disobedience. Partial obedience is still disobedience. And we must not give in to this temptation or this, this, this feeling, this, this belief that, well, I'm better than so-and-so. We're not comparing ourselves to so-and-so. Well, guess what, Pastor? I'm still forgiven. It's a wrong attitude. And sometimes we must be careful, too, because sometimes as, as believers, we get this, well, I'm forgiven, or, you know, we fully believe, fully support. This is script, I believe that's what Scripture teaches. Eternal security, assurance of salvation for those that have trusted Christ. Once saved, always saved, if saved. And sometimes, let's just be honest, sometimes we take that for granted. And, and we don't have a license to sin. <laughs> we must walk in total obedience to the Lord. I love what in Samuel 1 Samuel 15, 22, it is better to obey than to offer sacrifice. Remember the, the Old Testament system was they, they made, there's was, there was a lot of sacrifices they made. And what was happening, the people were making sacrifices to the Lord so others saw, hey, they, man, they must be doing well. Look at all the sacrifices. Look what all they're giving up. Look what all they're doing. But inside, their heart was so far away from the Lord. And what the Lord is saying there, it is better to obey than to sacrifice. What the Lord is saying is, I would rather you obey than to sacrifice because it's a heart issue. Remember when David was selected as king? I mean, they, they went through the whole list of all of Jesse's sons, and, and surely it's got to be one of these others. And Jesse's kind of like, well, I, you know, I'm paraphrasing. Well, I kind of got this scrawny, this scrawny last boy over here. You know, he's taking care of sheep. Let's, he, and almost like he's no good. David comes from taking care of sheep, and immediately the Lord speaks to Samuel and says, that's the next king. And it says, because it's his heart, because of his heart. He didn't look the part of a king, like some of David's other brothers, but he fit the part because of his heart. Partial obedience is still disobedience. Is God getting partial obedience from us? Man, I, I hope. In order to finish the race, I hope you will move, move into total obedience. So, finishing well, we see in this story. Finishing well is willing to serve no matter what. Finishing well is removing the known stumbling blocks. Finishing well is walking in total obedience. And finishing well is remembering our inheritance. Look in uh, Joshua 14. Joshua 14 See, in these, in these last chapters of Joshua, the word inheritance is used over 50 times. Okay, it means something. Let alone in, in 13, the word inheritance is used 13 times. I think the Lord's saying something there. And the inheritance is each tribe is getting their inheritance that the Lord had promised them all the way back throughout history. All, their inheritance was promised them all the way back in Genesis 17, 8, Exodus 3, 8, Leviticus 20, 20 through 24, and Deuteronomy 4, 20. For all of these years, for several hundred years, they've been promised an inheritance. And so what goes on from 13 on is each tribe is getting their inheritance from the Lord. In chapter 14, verses just 1 through 3, notice how many times the word inheritance is used. Now, these are the areas the Israelites received as an inheritance in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar, the priest, Joshua, son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel allotted to them. Their inheritances were assigned by lot to the nine and a half tribes as the Lord had commanded through Moses. Moses had granted the two and a half tribes their inheritance east of the Jordan, but had not granted the Levites an inheritance among the rest. For Joseph's descendants had become two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. The Levites received no share of the land, but only towns to live in with pasture lands for their flocks and herds. Did you notice that? 
four times the word inheritance is used just right there in those three verses, but it's used throughout chapter 13 as the land is divided up. But here's the deal. From our perspective, what inheritance is what? An inheritance is given after somebody dies, right? Hey, church, listen. 2,000 years ago, somebody died for us. Amen? 2,000 years ago, someone died for us, and his name was Jesus. And he has given those of us that have said yes to him, to be a follower of his, to trust in him, to live our life for him, we have an inheritance. Amen? Look in Ephesians chapter 1. Let's go to the New Testament. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. This is a great two verses. Church, followers of Christ, we have an inheritance. And there's, there's multiple verses. Paul uses that word quite a bit when he writes. His, you know, he wrote 13 books there in the New Testament. As believers in Christ, our inheritance, we get a new life. As believers in Christ, we have a new identity, a new purpose, new direction. We receive forgiveness. We receive eternal life in heaven. Okay, we know about that inheritance. We hear about that. We talk about that. But, man, it's not about just that. God still got you and I on this earth for a reason and on a purpose. Look at this, Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So we have heard the message of Jesus that he lived. Man, it's so cool this morning. This this morning I got to to visit with a young family that has a young young girl that had some questions and and just was just sharing scripture with her. It says, you know, when we hear about, when we hear about Christ, when we hear the message of Christ, that Jesus really lived, because he really did. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all attest to the fact of Jesus really living. And he really died. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give witnesses and testimony to the fact that Jesus really did die on the cross. It's not made up. They really died on the cross. But he died for a reason, a purpose, the Bible says. Well, not because the Bible says, because he really did for our sins. It says he died on the cross for our sins, which says, which means there's nothing we can do. To have our sins forgiven. Doesn't matter how good we are, what we have, nothing. Because he died for our sins. He took our sins. He took our punishment upon his shoulders. He lived, he died for our sins and was buried. We know he was buried. There were witnesses to that. The ladies that saw them put Jesus' body in the tomb, they showed up three days later to, to expecting the body to still be there to prepare the body for the burial but they show up and the tombs open the body's gone and Matthew Mark Luke and John all give credit give eyewitness accounts of Jesus's ascended body for for 40 days before Jesus ascended to heaven he during that time he was witnessed by his disciples He lived, he died for our sins, was buried, but man, he did stay buried. Amen, church? He rose from that grave, which validated what happened on the cross, the purpose of the cross. He rose from the grave to conquer death. Jesus conquered death. Amen? Because Jesus said, before this all happened, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die, yet they will still live. At death, believers' heart, all, their body shuts down like everybody else. But, man, at, at the moment of death, believers are immediately in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Amen? And the Bible says that we will be in the presence of the Lord Jesus forever. But not only that, he conquered the control of sin. So, Ephesians 1.13 and you were also included in Christ. Inheritance, we are included in Christ. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, when you trusted, when you said yes to Jesus, you were, notice what happens. When we did that, when we did that, immediately when we did that, we were marked in him with a seal. What's the purpose of a seal? To protect, to secure. 
the promised Holy Spirit, which comes upon us at the moment of salvation, who is a deposit guaranteeing our, what's that next word? Inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And the church said, amen. Folks, to finish well, man, we can't quit. And I know there are things going on in, in some of our lives, some of your lives. And, and for some of us, maybe not now, but maybe down the road, some, something that's easy going to come. And I'm not making light of it or not saying it's not difficult. That's not at all. But man, as your pastor and your friend, I just want to, I want to stand with you. I want to pray over you, pray with you. And I want to encourage you. I want the word of God to encourage you to keep going and finish well by serving the Lord. By removing those things that can so easily cause us to. Now, for you, what may cause you to stumble on somebody else, they're different. But, man, we got to remove those from us, not let them easily entangle us. And what we see with Joshua is we got to remember our inheritance. The Christian life is... It's a journey. There's, there are some phenomenal days, and there are some days that are tough. Remember our inheritance. Remember what Jesus did for you and for I. Amen? Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for your perfect, infallible, constant, consistent word. Father, I thank you for being good one of the things we have, we have continued to see throughout the book of Joshua is that you're good, your faithfulness, your grace, and your mercy, but also your just and your correction. Father, I, I pray for your church that we will walk in on total obedience. God, give us the boldness and the courage to remove whatever those stumbling blocks or those potential stumbling blocks are. Help us make that, those tough decisions. And Father, when, if, when things are going tough, may we look to you. May we look to you. As the Bible says, we will fix our eyes on you. As we saw last week, we were reminded of Jesus. When Jesus told Peter to get out of the boat, and Peter got out of the boat and started walking to your son. And, and when the wind came, Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, and he began to sink. Father, I just pray as the pastor of this church, I just pray that that been faithful to your word, faithful to your teaching, encourage your people to keep their eyes on Jesus. Father, encourage those right now that whatever that there is something going on in their life that is it's tough, it's painful, it's difficult. There's a grieving, I don't know. You know what it is. Lord, I pray they will keep their eyes on you. Keep their eyes on you and not the circumstances. Keep their eyes on you and not the situation. Keep their eyes on you and not their feelings. Keep their eyes on you, not what the world says. Keep their eyes on you, not what others say. They keep their eyes on you. And God, thank you. Thank you for the amazing inheritance we will have one day in heaven. But Lord, until then, you've kept us all breathing and living because part of our inheritance is the now. Lord, there are still too many people in Perkins and our surrounding communities that know about Jesus but are not sold out and following Jesus. God, raise up this church to continue to proclaim the greatest message, and that's Jesus. And I pray this your son's name. Amen. We have a response time. Joe's going to lead us in singing. We're going to sing a song together. We're going to celebrate with our voices. I'll be down front if I can pray with you. you got a question in the back. In the back will be Mike Philpott. He's going, if he can pray with you, if you got a prayer request, he would be glad. Or Mignon is back there. If there's something we can pray with you, I'm down front. Mignon's in the back. Mike's in the back. Let's stand. Let's sing. Let's respond. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed. The sin of man and wrath of God 
had been on Jesus lay silent as he stood accused beaten mocked and scorned bowing to the Father's will he took a crown of thorns oh that rugged cross my salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto Sin of heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree. Oh, that rugged cross my salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee now my debt is paid it is paid by the Now the curse has no home. The sun owns free. Know that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. Church, let's finish the race. Let's run the race, let's finish the race. We have a heavenly father that's not going to let us run this race by ourselves. And other times we may feel like it and it, it, we may think it, okay? But as he told Joshua over and over and over, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous and I am with you. And, and he says those same words to you and I because he is faithful and he's a promise keeper. Let's continue to be used by the Lord and serve the Lord. Let's continue to walk in total dep dependence. And let's continue to not let obstacles or potential obstacles knock us out of the way. And man, let's remember that inheritance that he has for each and every one of us. Amen, church. Man, it's great to have you all here. Uh, as Chris said at the beginning, guests, we're honored. If you're one of our guests, first or second or third time, uh, we're honored that you're, you've chosen to worship with us. Uh, I'll be down front after service if there's any questions I can answer about our church. But also, in a couple weeks, not next Sunday, I think it's the, the second Sunday in um, September, I'll be doing a class at 930 about who, what is, who is First Baptist Church? What do, we, what do we believe? Why do we believe this? Uh, you got questions about that, questions about baptism. Hey, what, is, what does it mean to be a Christian? Or, hey, I want to be a member. So it'll be in a couple weeks at 930. Just meet outside in this welcome area. Welcome Center area, and I'll see how many we've got, and then we'll have a class, uh, go through, through a few things, and I'll answer your questions uh, for you as well. Uh, a couple things. Hey, today is a wedding shower for Charity, Serene Charity. It is good to see you here. I'm trying to find the information here so I get the right time. Great to see you and, and Doug here today. So there's a wedding shower today at 3 to 4.30. Charity's a young lady. 
who has grown up in our church. And so we got a wedding shower for her today, open gym basketball tonight, Tuesday pickleball for anyone. Man, Wednesday, Wednesday night, great place for you and your family. Uh, some, some classes for all different ages. We have a grief share, a wonderful ministry, a wonderful support group that anyone is welcome to. It starts at 6, and then all the other Bible studies and classes start at 6.15. 6.30. There's a, uh, Greg and Joni Goss start, started a parenting class last week, but even if you weren't here last week, uh, it is still, um, yeah, that is an ongoing class, so I'd love to see you for that. So there's a couple more um, as well. And again, our children's ministry, Kim needs, Kim needs some help in the children's area uh, on Wednesday night or on a Sunday morning. So please see Kim if God has gifted you and equipped you to work with children. If he hasn't, we don't want you there. Okay, but God's got someplace else for you, okay? And you're like, hey, I, I, I really got some questions. I want to serve the Lord. I'm not exactly sure. Call me up this week. Send me an email. Let's get together. Uh, or any one of the staff, Chris or Joe, any one of us, call us up. Man, we, we want to get you plugged in, um, how God has gifted you and equipped you uh, for, his, for his work here at the church, but also throughout, uh, throughout the world. Uh, guests. You're going to do us a favor. You're going to leave your chair because you're our guest. Church family, let's go make much of Jesus, and then let's also put the chairs against the east and west wall. You all have an awesome week.